Hi, welcome everyone to Fossi Dialab. This is the first episode in our new series around evolving uh, communities. And the first one is today with Wilson Snyder talking about very late, and there will be a few more. The next one will be on CookWDB, then there will be one around OpenPython, and all of those projects have been around a very long time. Um, and we want to learn about how the community has changed over time, what were the challenging times, how great it is that everything is evolving and increasing steadily at the moment, a lot of interest, a lot of influx of new people. And yeah, I really want to learn about the first one because I think this is one of the oldest projects around. Very later has been used for a very long time. You can find this and other videos on our YouTube channel. Um, also, please subscribe so that you will get um, updated um, about new videos when we upload them. There's also other material from our conference, etc. that you can find there. If you have any questions, just ask them in the chat and I will uh, redirect them um, to, to Wilson after the presentation. So let's join Wilson. Hello, Hi. all, and thank you for joining us. Hi, so, how are you? Oh, sorry, I'm getting a little feedback. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, so thank you for joining us. And today, as we mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit about Verilator. So we'll start with uh, some of the history, how it came to be, uh, and then mostly talk about some of the recent enhancements that have been going on to support the program. So first of all, for, for those of you that aren't familiar with Verilator, what is, what is the fundamental idea? Well, the basic idea is Verilator is a system Verilog simulator and compiler. So you feed in a system Verilog RTL or limited verification design. So you see that there on the left-hand side. Verilator chunks on it, and it can spit out a number of different formats. It can it, use it for its traditional use, which is you feed C++ code, which it generates through your favorite C++ compiler like GCC or CLang or what have you. This then becomes an executable that you can then run and that will accomplish the simulation you want to accomplish. The other two main modes, there's a lint mode. If you're just interested in finding any warnings or problems with your code, you can get that output, so basically get screen output. Or there's also an XML output, which some people use for other tools, although there are, of course, other parses out there too. You're just going to use it for parsing. So why are people interested in Verilator? The, the first thing is that Verilator's primary focus is speed. Uh, it's pretty much the, it's definitely the fastest open source simulator, but it's also faster than most of the commercial simulators. And we'll have a detailed graph in this in a minute. It's very widely used, which, you know, some of that comes from being around a while and some of that also comes from the speed. So, you know, there's a large number of companies that are using it, some universities, a lot of corporations, Tesla, for example. Uh, a lot of these companies are using it in addition, oh, actually almost all of them are using it in addition to a closed source commercial simulator um, because basically they want some of the features that Verilator provides, generally speed being the main one. Verilator is community driven, it's an open source project. It's sponsored under the Chips Alliance and there, there is some uh, professional support available. So closed sources or closed and open source is not the same as commercial or not commercial. So Verilator is a technically a uh, open source, but uh, commercially, potentially commercially supportable tool. So let's jump into some of the history. So how did it come to be? Well, basically, if, if we go way back to 1993, uh, I, I happened to work at Digital Equipment Corporation at the time. And, you know, back in 1993, there was really only one open source program that I personally used and that most people used. And that was GNU Emacs, right? That was the editor that pretty much everyone liked to use. And that was basically, yeah, everyone had the whatever particular vendor, in this case, DEC, you know, they would have their own compiler, they would have all their own tools. And other than Emacs, you would basically use whatever came from the computer vendor. Uh, another interesting thing is 90, in 93, I went to a talk by this guy that sort of had this fun home project, uh, which was became Linux. Uh, so that was Linus. So he, he basically ported some stuff to one of our systems and, you know, talked about, you know, some things he liked, some things he didn't like. And, you know, it's kind of an interesting project. And obviously, we know what became of that. But what, what was the problem that sponsored Verilator becoming a program? Well, basically, we were going to be designing a DEC Alpha chipset. For you, those of you who remember, that was sort of a high performance risk architecture and basically the first general purpose 64-bit architecture. So we wanted to design that chip. C++ was what we've been using for test bench and for a lot of the CPU sort of high-level design. There was a new program called Synopsys and Synopsys Design Compiler. And basically, they had a program that would take uh, RTL Verilog and they would synthesize it. And they sent it to you actually on tapes. So, you know, I remember when you'd actually get DC on, on these tapes, you'd have to load up 
It's like version two point something. So Verilog was going to be the new synthesis language, and you know we thought about it, and so we decided, okay, well for this project, let's see if we can use this new RTL synthesis and code stuff up in Verilog. And the question is, is how do we hook all of this together with the test bench? And what we decided to do was was write a program to connect Verilog uh, into the C++. So in 1994, basically that was why Verilator was born. So Paul Wasson did the original code for Verilator. Uh, just from commits, the first commit happened to be on July 8th, 94. So that was obviously a while ago. So he did that initial code. He did, did the initial versions um, with, with some help from some other people. It was used to digital through the 90s with a lot of C++ touch messages, uh, got a number of improvements. And one, one thing I would point out, right, the reason it was written is there was no commercial alternative, right? You know, there, there was a you know, super slow Verilog XL, but it didn't generate C++. It wasn't really designed to hook in with C++. This, again, was before DPI. And actually, for that matter, it was, you know, most people were coding in C rather than C++. So then in 1997, uh, what happened is Digital Semiconductor, which was the semiconductor version of DEC, split into a division that became DEC which later got bought by Dell and et cetera, compact and long, long sequence of death, I guess you'd call it. Uh, and then half of the group also got bought by Intel and both groups wanted to be able to use Bear later. So what Dwayne Galby did is, is he said, okay, well, a way that both companies can use it and can guarantee that it's available and can contribute back uh, is by open sourcing it. So he drove it through the vice presidents and you know, that was almost a year long process to get it out. So then in the 2000s, it started to get some additional adoption outside Intel and DEC. Uh, notably, I happened to be at that time working at Nauticus Networks in 2001. There was System C, which had become a language a little bit earlier than that uh, in the late 90s, basically, but it was starting to gain popularity, and we decided to use that as our test bench language. So Verilator was extended to interface to System C, and it was a lot of the code was rewritten to be uh, pure C++, you know, clean C++, so to speak, relatively, <laughs> and that was version three. Then in 2005, we got the system Verilog and, and a lot of the synthesis features of system Verilog were added to Verilator. Um, and then I happened to change jobs to a job at Cycortex where likewise we use system C. So again, another round of improvements that I personally made in addition to the other improvements other people had made. So if we kind of, you know, then back out, you know, what's been going on over, you know, since 94 all the way up to 2021, you know, this is sort of, I'm not gonna read through all this, but this is basically an overview of some of the big things we've worked on. And you, know, you can read these slides after, but you know you see there's been a number of enhancements in a number of areas. You know, better language support, better parsing, a lot of usability improvements, uh, support for other backend tools like CLang and Microsoft Visual C, things like that. One of the main improvements uh, recently, so if we look at, at in the last three years, one of the things that was just committed, uh, all of the documentation just got rewritten. To, to be sort of a more modern uh, format using a read the doc style format. So if you haven't looked at the documentation, you might want to take a look and you know, like everything that's open source, you can just click on the link and edit it on GitHub if you're interested. One of the other recent enhancements was hierarchical and protect lib. So the idea here is, is if you have a super huge design, like let's say an entire system on a chip, what you can do is you can mark certain blocks as hierarchical blocks. So for example, like let's say you have a four core SOC, you could mark the CPUs, each of those individual four CPUs as hierarchical blocks. And Verilator will then run separately on the top and on all of those sub blocks. The reason for this is you can potentially use that if you want to protect the IP underneath the CPU. Like let's say you want to provide it to another group and you don't want them to see the IP, so you can do that. Uh, and the other main reason is, is it, it speeds up the Verilation loop. So if you have a, let's say you have a bug in that CPU, you can then just re-verilate and recompile only the CPU and not have to recompile the SOC on top. So it, it helps your response times for bugs and recompiling. And some of the switches behind this, and you know, you can you can just as references if you want to look at the documentation. So hierarchical is what does this submodule uh, verilation. Protectlib is a way of hiding the information within a verilator model, so it'll actually encrypt all the symbol names and do a bunch of other things. So that if you generate, let's say, a library file, you could then pass that library file on to some other company or some other individual and without exposing a lot of the details of your internal RTL design. And another feature I do recommend people use even when you're not using hierarchical and protectlib, there is dat dash build. So you, you no longer have to call make yourself if, if you don't want to. You can just call dat dash build and then very later will call make for you. So it just sort of simplifies the process. 
Another recent change this year is we now have the ability to have multiple simulation contexts. So it used to be you could only have a single simulation model in your process for the most part. Now you can have multiple of those. So if you're doing things like fault analysis or you need multiple completely independent simulations to be going on in the same process, you can do that by creating different contexts. And as part of that change, for those of you that have been using it for a while, there used to be a global function called SC timestamp. Uh, we're now recommending you change to use this context. And there's, a, there's an example here you can use for reference. You can also look at the documentation. So you know what we recommend is create a context and then call uh, a lot of the items that used to be static, like got finish and, and changing the time instead via the context. So you see here in this loop, this is kind of an example of what it would be to use a variolated model. Basically, you create this context. You then create the model. So this is just a a class that was created by Verilator. In other words, vModel is a, a C++ representation of your Verilog design. And then in your main program, you just have a loop that says, you know, while we haven't got a dollar sign finish command for this model, increment time by one nanosecond or whatever your time units are. And then you'd set some inputs on the class, and then you just call eval. And eval will do all the magic to evaluate the model and figure out your entire Verilog design. And then if you had outputs, you could then read the outputs. So this is the main loop that you'd see in most main.cpp files. And again, I do urge you to look at the documentation for more detailed examples. Another recent change is we now support dump file and dump vars. So if you're still calling the C++ wrapper calls to do tracing, you might want to consider switching to the more standardized dump file and dump vars. Uh, there's also a new option called dump threads. And that will then use multi-threading and put all of the tracing code onto another thread. So that's yet another way of speeding things up when you're doing tracing by using multiple CPUs. We've recently added support to do code coverage. Um, so what you can do is you can create code coverage on your Verilog design. We then create a .info file. We feed that through a bunch of standardized C++ tools. In other words, it's the same code coverage as you would use if you were writing C++. And then we can backfeed that into other tools. So for example, codecov.io is a website that, that is uh, free to use for, for small, for open source designs. And what it does is it then provides you a, a graphical interface in your browser that lets you see code coverage. So here's an example module. And you can see all these green lines. So all these green lines are saying all that code was executed. And now that I think about it, I probably should have shown an example with some lines that weren't executed, but <laughs> I forgot to do that. So you know, if there was a line of code that was not executed, it would be in red, or a branch was not executed, it would be in red. And then, and then that would tell you that you, know, you should go look at your stimulus and see why your code is not hitting that particular, being hit in that particular line and potentially improve your stimulus. So it's a way of avoiding bugs through code coverage. There's a whole boatload of new options. And again, these are all in the last two years. So we mentioned dash dash build and protect lib and then the thread tracing. Another good one is waiver output, which is a way to create a waiver file from all your linked messages. Uh, and again, you can review all this afterwards. I'm gonna go through all this because you, you'd all be bored to tears by the end of the presentation. There's a number of lint improvements again in the last two years. So, you know, things like looking for bad casts and bad imports. Uh, a lot of these, by the way, are disabled by default. So because they're just style warnings. So if you're doing a lot of lint, we certainly recommend doing dash W style. So turn on all the style warnings. And then as I mentioned a minute ago, there's this new waiver output if you want to create a waiver file. So that that'll list all of the warnings that were found and, and you can then re-import that file to no longer get those warnings. From the language side, again, a huge number of, of improvements, a lot of system calls, dump file and dump files we mentioned. Uh, we added associative arrays. We've recently added classes, although we're not done supporting classes yet. So there's a lot of things that are still not supported with classes. Uh, we also added the ability to split variables, so Verilator split var. So one of the certain annoyances of Verilator is it requires a static analysis and static ordering of the code. So sometimes it gives you an unopt flat warning. By putting a Verilator split bar in a place that Verilator itself recommends, you can then get around those warnings. So let's see what's up for this year and next couple of years. So, you know, we always want to maintain performance leadership. That's sort of the, you know, the reason for Verilator's original being and, and the main reason I think a lot of people use, at least especially on the corporate side. So we want to maintain the performance. We have a number of ideas. We just did some things related to rewriting ands and or statements to get better performance there. Uh, the, the big one that certainly needs more work, uh, actually needs to be started, uh, is doing better packing of the instruction cache. Uh, we know that that's the current thing limiting performance. It's, it's hard to improve that, but we do have some ideas. Uh, likewise, there's a number of ideas with clocking and bit vector repacking. 
uh, we have some big ideas for how to reduce some of the multi-threading. So on a, most of the models now, when you run multi-threading, you probably only get uh, at best a 50% CPU utilization on the threads. You know, so there's a, a factor or two or more there if we can just get the threads better used with it, and then plus other changes. So you know, with changes we see that are potential, if, if people are willing to work on the next couple of years, you know, our goals we could get at least 2x on the single thread performance and 5x multi-threaded. Um, and then if we people put in more work, you know, it's it's certainly possible to get some, some much much larger speed ups uh, with additional work. Although it's not currently on the roadmap, just because people aren't working on it yet. On the language support side, we are still only supporting unpacked structs. We convert them to packed, so, th so that will fix into unpacked. And there's a lot of work related to classes and methods. So for example, parameters and things like that. So those will need to get supported. That, that should be within the next year and a half or so. There's some work in progress for the IEEE scheduler. So we can support the scheduling necessary for UVM. And then longer term, there's a bunch of work we'd like to do on supporting more assertions and more coverage and random constraints and all that. And basically the goal is to get to be able to use full UVM simulation. So you should be able to, you know, it's always a year off, but <laughs> you know, in a year or two, you should be able to do full UVM simulation, uh, assuming people are willing to, you know, continue to contribute the time to, to make those features. On the parser, uh, we can, right now we can parse all UVM. So we have a full parser already there. Uh, we cannot split out all the XML yet. We're not yet fully through the elaboration process on UVM. So that's something we need to finish supporting. Uh, and then on the Lint front, so we just, as I said, we just finished the rewriting documentation so it's more easier to use. Uh, we've been adding a bunch of enhancements in how we dump structures and tracing for GTK waves. So there's also some more work there potentially. And of course, we're always adding Lint checks for users and things like that. And that, that'll basically be probably ongoing for other lint, lint sort of that subject that, excuse me, that is never ending. There, there was some work on BHDL that currently seems sort of a relatively dead thread, but, but that might be something that comes back, especially if at some point very later uh, takes a common parser that comes from Chip Alliance, one of the other consortiums. So we can do, uh, first thing, obviously, advocation's good, you know, saying you know about it, uh, asking people are using it, that, that sort of thing, you know, give it a try if you haven't tried it before. Uh, you know, again, if you're using UVM, to, you don't expect this going to work. But if you have a synthesizable design, most likely it will work, especially if you're using like C++ or Cocoa TV or something like that. You may already be using it under the covers. We certainly appreciate pull requests, uh, even if it's just correcting typos or, you know, especially if it's correcting something in a tutorial or, or making suggestions. You know, after you try it the first time, you probably find a bunch of things that like, oh, they should have told me that. Well, please just submit a pull request and we'll fix it for the next person. Of course, we welcome people to look at the bugs that are out there or, of course, file a new bug if there's something newly wrong and, and make pull requests. And again, it is, it is an open source tool. It is mostly community developed. So you know, we need the community to continue to make progress. Uh, and if you have resources to donate towards a larger ticket item or, or you yourself can do that, that the course is, would be very much appreciated. And you know, again, our goal is to get to uh, full UVM support in you know, a year or two, somewhere in that time frame. So there's a lot of work to get there. So that's basically it. So sort of a brief tour of where we've been and, and where we're going in the future. And I'd appreciate any questions. Thank you very much, Wilson. Thanks a lot. I'm wondering, so we, you did the transfer from internal to open source, right? It was always pretty centric around industrial needs already. So did you see any change after the switch, like in how you develop very late or like you got it. Like I remember, you changed a lot on like from Redmine to GitHub recently, for example. Like there's always challenges like collaborating with the outside world compared to a few users in the industry that give you feedback, right? Um, so this was my impression when I first used it like 10 years ago. <laughs> I think it was like a very small community compared to what you see nowadays on, in terms of tickets flowing in every day, right? Right. Now, cer certainly the biggest change I would say is is documentation and ease of use. You know, if, if you take out that version from 10 years ago, you get a, well, if you're lucky, you might get an okay error message. <laughs> I mean, it always printed out an error message, but it might be relatively cryptic. You know, so if you get do that now, you know, you'll get a, hopefully a much better error message. It'll show you the source code that did it. It'll point it like the symbol that has the problem. It'll even, in some cases, suggest, you know, the, the a reference to the manual. Um, and of course, there's all the tutorials. And like you said, there's also all the support around using GitHub, using more uh, standard tools. You know, like, for example, we've been st slowly migrating. There's still a little bit of Perl left, but for the most part, we moved a lot of the internals to a lot of the support tools around it to Python because people are just more used to it. 
-hmm. So there's certainly a good deal of work to sort of make things more standard and easier to support and easier to understand. And that'll obviously continue as time goes on. Okay. And so also, I think you have a large user base for ministry, right? And from what you can see, there's many people asking from big companies. Um, and so I'm wondering, so how are there, like, the discussions? I, I assume there's some discussion around proprietary tools and, um, and very later, like, obviously there's some comparison that they always ask for, I assume, the people <laughs> that use other tools too. Um, but I assume like UVM, for example, is a big ask for ministry. Do you see any other like large puzzle piece where companies say, okay, this feature is missing, so I won't use very later in production. Let it be support maybe, or is it something technical? Um, I mean, on the other hand, I see there's really a lot of people using it. So I'm wondering if you get this kind of feedback. Yeah, so most of the companies that are using it commercially, they are they generally want the C++ output. So, you know, there certainly have been cases where some companies have very interesting, unique coding styles and, you know, for example, use negative bit indices all over the place. Um, so kind of bit zero is always the, is always the, you know, if you're doing fluid fixed point, you use negative indices for the bits behind the decimal point, for example, the, the binary decimal point. Yeah, so there's sort of, there's always cases like that where some company has their own style and something that's not supported from a synthesis standpoint. Those are usually relatively easy to knock off. Uh, mm -hmm. From a verification standpoint, like you said, there, you know, we're trying to get to UVM. I, I think that particular feature is, at least right now, is kind of more driven by the non-commercial or at least the open source commercial marketplace as opposed to the traditional sort of closed source uh, silicon design companies because they have the commercial tools. So it's oh, not quite as interesting for them. Um, the, the other big thing that certainly needs work is, you know, if you feed a super huge design at it, uh, you do still have to mark sort of the hierarchical in that. So, you know, that is is another big sort of item on the on the large uh, chip design places, you know, what they really want to be able to do is take a huge chip, you know, a multi-billion gate chip and just throw it at it and just have it figure everything out. And, and we're not there yet. You know, but mm -hmm. for the most part, the, the, the good things about the larger companies, they usually are willing to uh, have a person that can spend a fair amount of time to figure out how to make the model. You know, mm -hmm. so, so a little bit of warts there is a little bit more accepted as opposed to, you know, let's say you're in a university and you, know, you don't want your students to have to figure out all these cryptic error messages and because you're oh, trying yeah. to teach them something. Uh, I see. Uh, so there's one question um, around, I think you mentioned it in the beginning roughly, like when was the first public appearance of Relate? I think it was incepted around 1996, seven, right? Yeah, actually, you know, that's a good question. I, it was somewhere around there. I, I'd have to actually look at what the first open version was. <laughs> it was somewhere in that neighborhood, yeah. Now yeah. it now seems so long ago. <laughs> So, so how long was it after you started the, the program? Like, and what was the, what, what, what was the decision to make it open source? Like, I think at this time, open source was still a little bit, like, not not widely used. <laughs> yeah, well, for for a while, you know, when digital um, split off the the group that went to Intel, that was technically you know, maybe I don't know six months to a year after that. Technically, it was open source, but it's open source and not really advertised anywhere. So even though it's open source, you know. In theory, if you knew the right person, you could ask for it, but it wasn't really on the web. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, like you said, somewhere in 97-ish, we made the Veripool, Dwayne Galby and myself made the Veripool website um, and actually put up the tarball. And for a while, it was basically just, you know, you could see it there, but, you know, unless you happen to stumble and plan, you know, there's no real advertising, right? <laughs> um, it wasn't really until the 2000s that I had given a couple of talks and there's uh, several other people had given talks. Uh, like Philips had used it for a lot of their television set design, for example. You know, that was in the era when people were just starting to get flat screens and things like that. So they had a number of DSPs, so they sort of adopted it. And that's when it sort of started getting more usage sort of by, you know, word of mouth and web advertising. So, well, not formal advertising, but, you know, people seeing it on the website and starting to use it more. Oh, I see. Um, so the, I'm um, wondering, so you had the coverage. And, uh, the question I ask myself, do you like you can have C++ model coverage, right? And the very low coverage. And um, do you see like, is it like, of course you can now have coverage of both. Like, do you have a, the possibility to, to correlate them to find like bottlenecks? As you say, like the end or, or generation, for example, might be a bottleneck or like some inefficiencies. Like, do you use it that way or is it a little bit off to try to match them together? Is there a way of matching it even? Yeah, so actually, I don't I don't know that much how many people are using it, but right now the the coverage that Verilator generates can get fed into the exact same C++ tools. So uh, it at uh, Cycortex in I guess it would have been 
mid 2000, 2010s uh, or so. Uh, no, sorry, mid 2000s. Uh, we, we were doing a lot of that. So with System C, that was a pretty common thing is you'd write a bunch of coverage in System C and then you'd write also coverage statements in System Verilog and the two would end up in the same file and you could cross correlate. I'm just not mm -hmm. sure how many people are doing that now, but there's certainly the ability. <laughs> oh, interesting. Um, yeah, so let me check for other questions so that I don't really use mine. Um, so one thing I um, I was wondering, like, like you see a lot of software people coming in, right? And like that's what I observe a little bit, which is really good, right? It's a lot of new faces that you see, and they come from a different background. Do you see any difference there? So that like sometimes I see discussions are a little bit different now, like. I remember some discussion around C plus plus eleven. I think and like this, like there's some mismatch maybe from people that come from university with a good software education, right, or like software engineering. And on the other hand, the supporting EDA industry with very ancient Red Hat machines, right? <laughs> right. Like, how do you perceive this? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I mean, sometimes, you know, if, if you look through the the old questions, there's certainly questions from, you know, some people that have that are basically just doing pure software. So someone just hands them a Verilog design and they want them to integrate with the model and they've never seen Verilog before. Uh, mm -hmm. So they, you know, they're super knowledgeable on the C++ tool chains and all that. And, you know, so some parts of the, like how to run make and all that, it's, you know, it's a no brainer. It just, they do it all the time. Um, but they have no idea what, you know, what's going on or, or even, the, you know, sort of the concurrency of system Verilog or, you know, they're just not familiar with the RTL constructs. And then on the converse, there's certainly many times you have someone that's like a verification engineer or, or RTL designer, and they've been speaking system Verilog, you know, since whenever they got out of college, probably. Uh, and they've never done any of the C++. So, you know, they're not familiar with make or, you know, all the build tools just because they don't generally have to know, use them. And um, I think it's interesting because, you know, you get different perspectives and, <laughs> you know, people kind of get to learn a little bit of both, uh, but you know, like I said, we've we've gotten better in some of the documentation. So I, I uh, think those. It seems like most of those have gone down a little bit, um, but people do still sometimes come in with you know a certain hat on, and they have certain um, assumptions <laughs> that may or may not be right. <laughs> but you know, that's okay. It's part of the fun. People have different experience. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so you, you talked about the hierarchy, or just this is a technical thing now, not about communities. Um, so do do you think about something like dynamic hierarchies like that you try to determine by yourself by the like by the by the size of the graph for example or subgraphs right where you want to cut right and like parallelize the design and long run maybe run some large scale parallelized designs on, on some cluster machines or so yeah i mean i suspect i suspect in a while we'll get there we're not there right now i mean it very well let me be more correct within a particular verilator run it does that all that now. That's the, the way it basically figures out how to do multi-threaded. So it breaks things into um, what are called M tasks. There's a document that describes all the technical details, but basically, it, yes, right now it breaks down the design into all these little pieces, figures out how to multi-thread them, schedules them, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Above that, in terms of hierarchical, having multiple verilator runs, right now there isn't that step. Right now it does require manual intervention, but you know, it certainly um, it wouldn't be completely optimal, but but it could probably could do a pretty good job. I, in theory, it should be able to do as good as a human, but you know, it could probably get pretty close. It's just something mm -hmm. that right now we haven't yet spent time on. So, as you spoke about Python support, there's a lot of room for Python tooling then. <laughs> very popular nowadays. Um, I think that's very interesting. Um, there's a question from the audience that you probably hear quite a lot. <laughs> can very later be an alternative to Synopsis VCS? Um, very later can be an alternative to commercial closed source tools. <laughs> so it can be, I guess the, the, the main caveat there, right? It, so so I, I guess there's, there's one technical and then there's one logistical problem, at least. Uh, from a technical standpoint, you know, Verilator right now is a cycle-based simulator that doesn't support UVM. So if you're running UVM uh, or you're running, let's say, back annotated gate simulations or you're running mixed signal simulations or you're doing anything other than sort of bare bones, simple RTL simulation, Verilator doesn't support that. So that's sort of the technical reason not to use it. And, and by the way, it probably never will support STF annotation. I, I think that's, you know, it, it's just not interesting for Verilator to do that. It's sort of contrary to the fundamentals of how it's designed. So, you know, that's an example of something if you're ever going to do most, most likely, you'll, you just have to stick with a uh, commercial closed source tool. Mm -hmm. the, the, the other one, which is, you know, sort of more practical is, you know, when you pay a third party 
uh, or when you pay a simulation house, you know, for support, they're giving you support and you'll get a much better level of support. Now, again, there are some support organizations that can help you out with Verilator, you know, but I, I'm not going to claim that, you know, that's not yet the infrastructure you're going to get with a, you know, company that has, you know, literally hundreds of FAEs all across the world that understand the tool. So right now, if you're going to use Verilator, you know, you certainly can, can look at helping, paying someone to help you with support. But for the most part, most people, uh, you, most people need to understand that they're going to have to spend some time to invest how to learn the tool and how to drive it themselves, um, mm -hmm. which some companies are willing to do and some aren't. But, you know, you need to view it as are you going to spend that? Are you going to spend your own resources to do something that otherwise you might be able to pay an FAE for? And, and you know, that, that's a totally fair trade off. I mean, you know, and in my day job, I do that all the time, right? You know, there's there's some things that are strategic for my company to work on and some things that prefer just outsource. And that's a company's decision. There's no right or wrong answer there. <laughs> I see. And on a technical side, probably there's also, like there's a big advantage by creating C++ code and you don't want to lose significant performance by adding like gate level stuff, for example. Like, I think that's, easy. that's one of the big advantages and why it's so so efficient to use, right? It's, it's you, right, yeah. Right. Some of the features you probably don't want because they will slow down the average case. <laughs> that, that would be bad. Uh, there's a question from the audience. Um, uh, have you considered signal execution ordering for speed up, or is it already included? Yeah, it already does that. So Verilator will uh, break up always statements into little sub blocks. It'll then reorder all the statements within you know what's legal um, and try to pick an optimal ordering. And that's most of the reason that it's faster than most of the current other closed source tools. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's because basically it, it does things that are, let's say, questionable in terms of the letter of the law of IEEE, but will give you the same results <laughs> in the end. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I'm wondering if someone wants to start working on Verilite, or of course, like this documentation, et cetera, but what are the skills and like the background, not, not like programming language, but more like in, in concepts that you should know before you really dig into Verilite itself? So I remember like you should know what an AST is, obviously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but do you have any recommendations there, like for people that say, okay, I want to, I have a certain problem and I want to address it, or maybe like a small bug that I found. But I found you have to understand all corners of very late before you can make a meaningful patch. Sometimes, <laughs> um, on the way of finding what you're actually looking for, right? Um, so so do you have any suggestions there, like what you should probably refresh from your university knowledge <laughs> before you started? Yeah, well, I mean, it certainly depends what you're going to work on. I mean, I, the ideal is. You, you have a good idea of how any sort of compiler works. And that's where AST trees come from. Uh, and almost all compilers are the same. There's a lot of good books and classes on compiler design that, that can get you some idea. But you know, I think most of the people, to be honest, that contribute don't have that background. I think almost all of them are, you know, there's a, there's a good number of people that came from a C++ background. Again, it's kind of the more software background. And you know, they understand the C++ concepts. And I think that's enough to, to make good progress. And likewise, there's been you know, several good contributions by people that had never seen C++ code, but, you know, they can contribute good tests and, and things like that and more on the system Verilog side. Mm -hmm. So uh, even if you don't have a background in, you know, compiler design, which I, I understand very few people do. So, <laughs> you know, it's still, it's still, it's still learnable. You know, this curve is there is a little bit more, but, you know, mo most people, actually almost all of them with, with a few rare exceptions, actually when, when I'll mention in a minute, uh, you know, most people start with something small, like, I don't know, it used to be that there were some, you know, very simple keywords or things that weren't supported. So, you know, you can kind of give a checklist of here's the things you need to do to implement that new keyword or that new function. And you know, it's pretty easy to go in. Unfortunately, a lot of those sort of simple things have already been done, uh, but there's still some things like that. Um, you know, there have been cases just sort of the other direction. You know, there was there was one, I mean, maybe 10 years ago or so, there was one, you know, entirely new optimization and pull request that was maybe you know, 500 lines of code or something. And I'd never talked to the person before, at least as far as I can remember, I'd never talked to the person before. And it just kind of arrived and said, you know, what do you think of this? <laughs> it's like, wow, <laughs> you figured all that out by yourself, never asking a question. So there's right. that too. You know, it's sort of amazing that, you know, someone would, I mean, it's impressive, right? You wouldn't expect, you know, it, even mm -hmm. if I was going to do something like that with, with a project, I would typically ask because, you know, I wouldn't, I'd be afraid I, I might be rejected or what have you, <laughs> which of course <laughs> didn't happen. But you know, it's it's impressive that someone would make that level of contribution without ever having to ask a question. Yeah. That's something I also observe with your communication style. You always try to like. Uh, I think it's not out of your lack of time, which you obviously obviously also have, right? But you're very encouraging, asking people, do you want to look at it yourself, and 
give them pointers, right? Those are the steps that you would do. Often, like, sometimes I think, like, in this time that you wrote this, you probably would have done it by yourself, right? Um, so do you have some kind of strategy there? Do you think it's it's important to encourage people to also work on the code, like, at least have a look at the code base if they feel like it, right? Um, right. You, you always, like, make a guess around the background, where they're coming from. You can sometimes read. But do you have some kind of strategy there, or is it just your impulse? That <laughs> Yeah, no, actually, you know, it's interesting that that's actually a strategy. And I don't know, maybe I shouldn't be admitting this on a call, but I don't know, <laughs> it's, it's not a bad thing, which is fine. No, actually, I, I went to a talk um, quite a while ago now, maybe, maybe 15 years ago on uh, fostering open source development. Mm -hmm. And they made a very good point that, you know, you should always try to ask people, your first job should be basically to expand the number of contributors. So, you know, even if something is easy for you, you should sort of suppress that urge to quickly fix something and instead <laughs> see if you can get someone to contribute something. Uh, because chances are, if they do that, then they pro they'd be more invested and chances are you'll get, you'll get a better, you know, yeah. you get something that they're interested in. You know, they'll like it more and you'll like it more because eventually you'll get contribution. So, you know, that was a conscious strategy I've tried to do since that talk. And I, I think it's been helpful. I think it's a good, I hope other people think so. Uh, I think it's a good way to try to get you know additional contributors and and get people invested in making improvements and and even though it's probably more work for the person, I, I suspect that I, I at least hope that they uh, enjoy the process and you know value their accomplishment. <laughs> yeah, I think it's good to see that you have something fixed yourself, right? I think that's a common need that you feel sometimes. <laughs> um, yeah, and I also like the observation that I made is like you had the style already before before like. So like the whole platform, people often argue about GitHub and Redmine and use their own platforms, et cetera, but it's not really depending on this platform, right? It's just a technicality. In the end, it's about style, right? And I think this is, I think many people, including me, they, they, they strongly like the way that you're talking to, to, to people, right? And I think that's very, very important, like especially if you run such a large project and have so many people with, coming in from different backgrounds, I think that's, um, so to me, it sometimes feels hard to stay calm sometimes. Like, and I, I really like the way that you're talking to everyone and like just asking for constructive feedback, asking for, do you want to have a look at it yourself? Do you can you like, like it's 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 entirely different from many other projects that I see, and, and I really value it a lot. I think it's, it's many people well, like it. So well, thank you. I, I'm not sure anyone has ever directly said that, so I appreciate I appreciate that. So there's no further questions from the audience. So I want to thank you very much. I could ask you a hundred more questions, but um, I hope we will meet again once the pandemic is over and um, we can travel again and see it some occasion. Uh, hopefully hold some conferences again. That would be great. Um, but it was really great to have you on, on Posse Dialogue. Um, highly appreciate it. I think many people don't really know where projects are coming from and how they evolved and then just come in and see, okay, there's a large project. Like how did this happen? I think it's important to see how it developed, developed and how your community evolved. And I think you're really at a great stage. Thank you very much, Wilson. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So everyone else, see you again in four weeks. Philip Wagner will speak about CocoDB, which had a very bumpy road. It's not as long as the road of very later, but um, it has like um, it has died and revived. <laughs> um, has grown to be a very large project. Um, a lot of overlaps with very later. Um, so Thank you very much for, for tuning in. You can find more on our um, on our channel. You can find the other presentation on our website. And please tune in again next time. Bye.